I want to just key in on a couple of key verses in Hebrews chapter 10 tonight that are going to help us to jump into the other element of this that as a new creation, nudge your neighbor and say, you've got to know this, you new creation, you. Tell them that. If you're going to walk in, if you're going to walk in this thing as God has purposed you to walk, this is something that you have to know and have to have settled. Now, I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit tonight to get us into some things because there's so much. I mean, I, I, was, I, was, I was like four or five hours in the Word today. Just in, so I just love studying the Word. There's so much. I mean, it's so rich. And the more you know, the more you know that you don't know as much as you think you know, but you're always finding out there's something more to know. And the Spirit of God keeps giving it to you. So, so, so we're going to begin in verse 1 once again. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. Now we talked about this last night, that the Hebrew writer is comparing. Everybody say comparing. comparing. He is comparing and contrasting the old covenant with its sacrifices, its statutes, its commandments, and its ordinances with the new covenant that has come to us in and through Christ Jesus. As a matter of fact, and we'll look at this a little later, the Hebrew writer calls Jesus the apostle and high priest of this new covenant. It's very important. Just as Moses is the, if you will, the apostle, although that word is not used in the Old Covenant, but it simply means apostolos, it's a Greek word, which literally means one sent. One sent. Moses was sent to Israel with the law. He's the lawgiver. Jesus was sent to Israel first and then to the world with grace and truth. The law was given through Moses, but, talk to me, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Moses himself, see, you've got to get this. When you read your Bible, where are my Bible readers, the seven of you that read? Come on, let me say, what, what, you, what, you, you, you know, I'm going to stop saying that. Okay, but, 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 but now listen to me. Moses himself said, when, as he was given, he said, a prophet like unto me shall the Lord your God raise up, and him you shall hear in everything he teaches. In other words, Moses understood that there was another prophet like him that was going to be raised up with a whole new co covenant and a whole new order. I came with the law, but there's another one coming. <laughs> Which is why John in his gospel in the beginning, he, he contrasts them and he says, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. These are, if you will, the, the, the ones who were sent with message. I don't want to get into all that. Uh, verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. Now, what is the Hebrew writer saying? He's saying all of these sacrifices, all of these ordinances, all these offerings for sin, the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies uh, under the Old Covenant, all the sin offerings, the trespass offerings, the wave offerings, the heave offerings, and every offering and every ordinance in that Old Covenant, he said those things were offered continually year by year and that was a shadow of something that was to come. Are you still here? But he makes the point right off the bat. He said none of those offerings in the Old Covenant could ever, ever uh, deal with the point that God was after getting settled. And here's what he said. He says because if any of them had dealt with it, look at verse 2, then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. Now here's what he's saying. If any one of those old covenant sacrifices 
had done the ultimate job, they would have ceased to be offered. He says, because the worshiper, everybody say the worshiper. The worshiper. That, 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 that's, that's you and I, that's the high priest, that's the one who brought the offering. He says, the worshiper, once purified or once the matter was set up, would have had no more consciousness of sins. I want you to get what is being said here. He is saying to us that if any one of those old covenant sacrifices had done the job, there would have been an inward witness. There would have been an inward knowing on the part of the worshiper, meaning the one who brought it. Are y'all here? There would have been an inward witness on the part of the worshiper, an inward knowing that everything that needs to be settled has been settled and we don't have to bring another sacrifice or another offering for sin. Are you still here? Watch this. For, for the worshipers once purified would have had no more cautions of sins. But in those sacrifices, there was a reminder of sins every year. Now he's talking specifically about Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement when the high priest was to go into the Holy of Holies with the blood of bulls and goats, make the sacrifice, then come back out and, uh, and testify to the people that the offering has been accepted and it was called the Day of Atonement at one meant at one. It was that which brought the people of God and God back into oneness. Once the sin issue was dealt with every year, the people were back at one with God. Would you look at your neighbor and say, oneness was the objective. Look at your other neighbor and say, no separation between God and his creation. Look at your neighbor and say, that was the objective. I need you to get this. That was the objective of every sacrifice, every sin offering, every trespass offering, every ordinance, every commandment. It was to keep God and his creation one. And, and what he's saying is none of those old covenant sacrifices actually accomplished that. And if any one of them had, they would have ceased to be offered. Someone would have recognized, hey, we're done. Everything's fixed. Now, here's what I want you to see. It is and always has been God's desire for his creation to have that knowing. What knowing? The knowing that God and them are one. That they are together and nothing can separate them. See, this is why the Apostle Paul says, I am persuaded. Now, he's speaking new covenant reality. I'm absolutely convinced that neither height nor depth, that nothing, can that neither height nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, shall be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Because the objective of God from the beginning of his creation was for he and his creation to be at one and for his creation to have no fear of ever being separated from him. Now you need to understand this. That was God's desire from the beginning. Are you still here? And... Woo! Because that was his desire from the beginning, that is what the plan of redemption was all about. To get man back to the place where he knew beyond the shadow of any doubt that nothing could separate him from the love of God. Now here's the problem. In most churches today, hardly anybody is convinced of that. Boy, boy, it's quiet in here. I don't care where you go. In most churches, 
you, you, you won't find 10% of the people in most churches who are sure of what I just said to you. And the red of Oreba Shate, Elamake Sanda, man, I'm in it already. And the reason that you won't find that is because the gospel that we have preached, the gospel that we preachers have preached, is a mixture of old and new covenant truth. And most of us have been afraid to actually speak new covenant truth or get into new covenant truth because when you actually start finding it out, it is so good. The yoke is so easy. You're not listening to me. And the burden is so light that if you actually preach it to people, you're afraid they won't need you anymore. But the fact of the matter is if you actually start preaching this to people, man, they will break down the doors to get some more of this because when you start walking in this, I got, I got, I, uh, no, I, I, got, I got some ground to travel. See, I'm so excited because I'm at the end of it, but I got to get you to the end of it. Are you still here? Now, I read a bunch of this last night, so I'm not going to read it all because if I read it all again, I'll get stuck. Okay, are you still here? Yes. I said, are you still here? Yes. Now, 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 go down, go, 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 go down, <sighs> Jesus. I, I mean, I, I did, I, I. Uh. Okay, let me just start in verse two again. For the worshipers once purified, now get it, the worshipers once purified. In other words, he said, once the worshiper knows that they've been purified, that the matter of sin has been settled, there will be no more consciousness of sin. <sighs> now I am telling you by the spirit of grace that this is where God wants you and I to live in relationship with him where there is no more consciousness of sin. Now, the fact of the matter is, that is a reality. But for you and I to walk in that reality as new creations, it must be built into our spirits by the word of God, by the revelation of the word of God. And if you could see it, if you could see it like this, you, you know, if you could see it, if you could see the outline of a human individual. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the new creation now. I'm going to give you a picture of the new creation. Everything that God's word says about the new creation is true. The Bible says sins have been remitted. So there should be no more consciousness of sins. I'm going to show you the Bible. I'm going to read the Bible to you. Are you still here? Because that is a reality in the heavens. The sin issue has been dealt with. Yeah. Here's the question. If the sin issue has been dealt with, why is it the major topic of conversation in church? Oh. 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 Don't, don't get me wrong. Because see, you got to be here tonight and tomorrow night to get this. Or else you're going to think I'm preaching heresy. I am not. I'm preaching gospel. Yeah. But because you have heard so much heresy, and accepted it as gospel. <laughs> when the truth actually begins to be preached to you, you, you your mind wants to reject it. I'm, everything I'm going to say to you is in the word of God. I will say nothing that I want you to believe and accept that I will not back up in the word of God. That's why it takes me a little more time because I'm dealing with you about stuff that you haven't heard this way. And so I got to show you chapter and verse so you know I'm not making it up. Just like this idea, no more consciousness of sin. Do you see that in your Bible? Yes, it is. He says the, the worshiper, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sin, meaning they would have no need to bring anything to God to try to make things better, try to make up for it. Now, you, can, you, you will know immediately if you are living in that place of no more consciousness of sin. Because if when you approach God in prayer or worship, the first thing on your mind is making sure that your slate is clean, you have consciousness of sins. 
Boy, it's quiet in the building. If when you go to pray, the first thing you do is confess all your sins, it's because you have consciousness of sin. If you make deals with God in prayer like I'll never do it again or if you bless me one more time like God could bless you one more time, he's a blesser. He can't get next to you without blessing you. So if you, if you, if you have deal, if you make deals like that with God, God, if you just, Lord, you just, you just hear me one more time, Lord, just, I'll never do it again. Now, we're all laughing because we've all done it. We all have, including me. I don't do it anymore. Haven't done it in years. And, 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 and see, it's, it's not because I'm so flawless. It's because I have allowed the Holy Spirit to build into my spirit the revelation of the new creation and I will not allow the enemy to pull me back into that other covenant. Stay with me. I said stay with me. Are you with me? Lay your hand on your brother, lay your hand on your sister and say I'm not going either. Uh. Look, look at verse, uh. look, look at verse number eight. I'm just going to read because there's no, way, there's no place to just drop in here because I want to try to explain everything, everybody, but I can't do it. I just got to read. Look, previously saying, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them. Now, are, are you still here? Yes. I said, are, are you still here? Yes. Now, 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 he's quoting scripture here. He's quoting scripture here. Previously saying sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them. So this is what God said. God said, I, I never really desired sacrifices and burnt offerings for sin. I told you to bring them, but that was not what I was after. I told you to bring them temporarily so you and I could have some sort of relationship, but that was never my objective. Are you still here? Then he said, this is the pre-incarnate word, uh, as I spoke about last night, not going back into this, said, behold, I've come to do your will. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. He takes away the first. What is the first? Sacrifices, offerings, and burnt offerings for sin. He takes those away so that he can establish the second, which is the actual will of God, which means if you can read, it's clear that sacrifices, burnt offerings, and offerings for sin are not the will of God. If they were, he wouldn't say he takes away the first that he may establish the second and call the second the will of God. Now look at verse number 10. By that will, by what will? By the performance of what God was actually after. Who performed that? Jesus of Nazareth. By the performance of what God was actually after, we have been sanctified. Sanctified, hagios in Greek, separated, made distinct from, made other than. That's what the word holy means, hagios, to be separate from, distinct from, or other than. So we have been made separate from, distinct from, and other than, other than what? Sin. And sinners. Are you still here? So you've got to get this straight. You cannot be a sinner saved by grace. You are either a sinner or you're saved by grace. If you're saved by grace, you're not a sinner. And if you're a sinner, you're not saved by grace. You can't be both. Well, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Pick one. You can't be both. If you're a sinner, then you're not saved by grace. If you're saved by grace, you're a new creation. Therefore, you cannot be a sinner because that's a part of the old creation. Yeah. 
by that will, by what Jesus has done, verse 10, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. Again, the words for all are not in the original Greek. He did it once. He doesn't have to do it again. Still here? And every high priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So once again, he's pointing out what was the point of the sacrifices to take away sins. But this man, meaning Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God. Now go down to verse 15. He says, the Holy Spirit also told us this was going to happen. He witnesses this to us. For after he said, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now notice, all of this is in quotations. He is quoting Jeremiah 31, verses 33 and 34. These are written in the prophecy of Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah some seven, eight hundred years before that this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get rid of all these sacrifices and burnt offerings. I'm going to put my laws in the hearts of the people and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now watch, watch the conclusion. He says, now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Where there is remission of sins, there is no longer an offering for sin. Now notice what he says here. Where, where remission of sins is. Not just forgiveness, but remission. Once again, the word remission, the Greek word is afe ime, it, it, from two Greek words, apo meaning off, and heme, to send away. To send away off of you. See, this is what Jesus did with your sins. He sent them away off. Apo heme. He sent them away off of you. He, what, 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 what am I doing? You keep looking at me. I preached myself out of my clothes. Thank you. To send away off. The word remit. See, you will never see the word remission used anywhere in the Old Covenant. Remission is a word that is only used in the New Covenant. Atonement is used in the Old Covenant. Sins were never remitted in the Old Covenant. They were atoned for. To atone means to cover and make it one. To remit means to send away off of. Are you still here? And in the New Covenant, sin is why, is why anybody who starts talking to you about the need to atone, is pulling you back into an old system. Mm. I don't want to go into that. Are you still with me? Now, now, here, here is the reality. There are three categories of people. There are those who have no idea of what we're talking about. There are those who have an idea of what we're talking about, but are not conscious of it by revelation knowledge. And then there are those who possess what we're talking about and are conscious of it because of the spirit of revelation. And here's the fact. Without a revelation of this, without a revelation of what I'm talking to you about, you never truly get past the sin issue. Are you still here? You never really get past the sin issue, which means most Christians spend a majority of their Christian life fighting with a particular sin, fighting with the sin issue, or dealing constantly with the consciousness of sin, and therefore never walking in the reality of the new creation, never walking in the reality of the new creation because they are always dealing with a consciousness of sin. Now here, now, now children, I'm, I'm about, I'm, now here is the reality. That kind of life 
is only marginally preferable to being a sinner. Which is why most Christians are more miserable than most sinners. Come on, let's be real. No, 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 no. No, let's, let's be real. Most Christians are more miserable than most sinners. Do you know why sinners aren't miserable in their sin? Because they have no consciousness of sin. The problem is they have no consciousness of sin, but they are still separated from God. Then what happens to us when we get connected to God, we get constantly preached to about sin. And so now you've got new creations who are being preached to about sin and have sin consciousness constantly being reinforced in this. There is another way of living. There's another level. And that is to be the new creation. But to have no consciousness of sin because you are absolutely positively certain that the matter has been settled by the blood of Jesus and now you begin to walk in liberty. And this is what the Spirit of God is raising up in these last days. But you can't fake this. You, you can't fake this. This has to be built into your spirit by revelation knowledge from the Word of God. And in order to build it in, there are some things that have to be settled. I said settled. I said settled. And not settled because you believe it. No, no, no. Settled because you know that you know that you know Okay, so how do you get there? How do you get there? You get there by revelation of the Word of God. You say, Bishop, where do you get that stuff you just said? I get it from the book of Romans. See, Paul says this himself in Romans chapter 7. He says, I was alive once without the law. That's what he says in Romans. He says, I was alive once without the law. In other words, he said, before anybody told me, thou shalt not, I was cool. I was cool doing anything I wanted to do. I was alive. I was cool. Now, 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 I was on my way to hell, but I felt okay. I mean, I wasn't redeemed. I wasn't saved. But I, but he said, I was alive once without the law. He said, but then the law came, sin revived, and I died. Are y'all here? So I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And this is where most Christians live. Are you still here? Yeah. I said, are you still here? Yeah. So now, go real quickly to Romans chapter 5, because we've got to start dealing with this issue. We've got to start dealing with it in real time. Are you still with me? Yeah. Now look at Romans chapter 5. Jesus, help me, please. Please help me get through this. Because in, woo! Okay, I'll, I'll do it that way. I'll do it that way. In Romans chapter 5, Paul begins to introduce a discussion of some things that you, look at your neighbor and say, you new creation, you. That you have to know in order to walk in the revelation of the truth that Paul walked in and those early apostles walked in. Now, look at, I'm, I'm going to read a couple of verses. Therefore, just, I'm at verse 12. Of Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Now, watch this. For until the law, sin was in the world, 
But sin is not imputed where there is no law. In other words, it's not credited to your account. Are you still here? Now, we got to deal with this just a moment because because we read past this stuff, we're like, whoo, praise God, and we don't understand how, how it was with that. So, so watch this. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin. we got to qualify some terms. I can't go any further until I qualify some terms. So let's qualify some terms. And I gave these terms to you back there, so when I say them, put them up on the screen. If you're taking notes, take these notes, because you need this and here information. You need this information. Are you still here? Yes. We're going to qualify some terms. The word sin. Everybody say sin. sin. The word sin, the Greek word is harmatia. H-A-R-M-A-T-I-A. -A -A, and it means to miss the mark, the target, or the bullseye. Sin means to miss the mark. Meaning, there is a mark that has been set. There's a bullseye you're supposed to be hitting in the areas of your life. That bullseye is set by God, the Creator. Now, this is why creation is such a significant part of walking with God. Because if there is no Creator, then no one is qualified to set the mark. Which is why humanism and the educational system will work overtime, double time, triple time in order to convince our children that there is no creator. Because if there is no creator, then no one is qualified to set the mark. So now you can be male and female. You can be several genders if you want to. That devil is a liar. See, nobody wants to say this. But see, if there is no creator, then nobody has the authority to say what is and what isn't the mark. Are you still here? So, sin, the word sin literally means to miss the mark. Are you still here? So God set a mark. Okay, we'll get to that in just a moment. The word death. Scripturally now, death in Scripture means separation from the fellowship, goodness, resources, and influence of God the Father, of the Father. Now, where do you get that definition of death? See, you got to renew your mind to what death means because everywhere the Bible talks about death, this is what it's talking about. It's not talking about being in a box. It's not talking about lifelessness. It is not talking about the cessation of existence because according to the scripture, no spirit ceases to exist. The fact of the matter is whether you, when you leave this body, you are not dead. You either go into the presence of God or away from the presence of God. Which is why the scriptural definition of death is not the cessation of existence. It is to be separated from the goodness, influence, fellowship, and resources of the Father. Now, where do you get that definition, Bishop Thou? I get that definition from Luke chapter 15, when Jesus gives the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. You remember that? Remember, parable, parabole, to throw alongside. The word parable means to cast alongside. A parable is a story that Jesus cast alongside a spiritual truth in order to demonstrate the spiritual truth. And he said, if you can understand this story, you can understand the spiritual truth. Parabole, a parable. Are you still here? So Jesus gives this parable. He throws this story alongside the spiritual truth so that you can see it. And when the boy, and I got I to go chapter and verse. Uh, 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 I got to go chapter and verse. Uh, let's go to Luke 15. Let's go to Luke 15. Uh, 
see, see, I just want to, I just want to get to this stuff. But see, if I, if I just go and say it, then you, you be like, well, I'm not sure that's right. I don't see it in the Bible. I don't want to see it in the Bible. So, 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 so look, look, look. Uh, b- verse. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, when the boy comes back, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again, which would be the equivalent of being born again. So this, my son was dead. What, how was he dead? He was separated from the fellowship, the goodness, the resources, and the influence of his father. And as long as he was separated from them, he could not walk like a son. The son he was always intended to be. So when he comes back, the father says, this my son which was dead is now alive. Now you understand what it means to be dead in trespasses and in sins. It means as long as you are in sins, you are separated from the goodness, the fellowship, the resources, and the influence of your father. So to be born again is to be born back into fellowship, goodness, to be born back to the resources and the influence of your father. This is what it means to be born again. Next term, now you got to understand this because this is what we're going to be talking about for the, for the rest of this night and tomorrow night. And if you don't understand this, if you don't understand what the Bible means when it says death, what the Bible means when it says righteousness, what the Bible, are y'all here? What the Bible means when it says sin. Because see, if you don't understand what the Bible means when it says sin, then you won't understand tomorrow when we get to the truth that he that is born of God sins not. And that's in every Christian's Bible, but I have hardly ever met a Christian who believes it or who actually understands it. And the reason we don't believe it or understand it is because we don't understand what sin is. And tomorrow I'm going to show you why if you are a new creation, it is impossible for you to sin. I said impossible. Now, I didn't didn't say it was impossible for you to be wrong. I didn't say it was impossible for you to do wrong. I said it's impossible for you to sin. You still here? Now, now I'm not seeing some of y'all looking at me. Oh, I was with you till just then, Reverend. But But I also, I already read to you. Are y'all bored? No. I already read to you, before we even get to all the truth, I already read to you the principle by which the statement I just made is absolutely true. I'll go back to it in just a moment, and then I'll show you when we get to it. Okay? i got to give you some more terms. Righteousness. Righteousness. Righteousness is the right standing or right relationship with God, which God supplies. I have it in capital letters there, which God supplies. Because that separates the righteousness the Bible talks about from the righteousness religion has preached to you. Because the righteousness which the Bible talks about is the right standing or the right relationship with God which God supplies, not the one you earn. Right. 
not the righteousness you work for. Not the one that is yours because of good deeds or good actions or good performances. The righteousness of God is the right standing or right relationship with God which God supplies to you, which God gives to you. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't do enough good to be considered it. It is something he gives to you and you have to receive it and then declare it and only then will you be able to model it because it does not come by your performance. Which is why in the old covenant, the, the prophet said it this way. God said, all of your righteousness is as filthy rags. You know, everything you do, no matter how good you think it is, does not meet the standard of my righteousness. So there's nothing you can do to get it except receive it. Now, this is why, this is why, uh, uh, everybody say righteousness is the right standing with God. It's the right relationship with God, which God supplies, N not the one I get. See, this is why, and, and I've said this before to, to, to those of you that are connected to this anointing. See, when, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, and so you've got to remember who Jesus was sent to and who John the Baptist was sent to. He was not sent to the world in his earthly ministry. He was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Are you here? So the context of his entire earthly ministry has to do with Israel. And John the Baptist was sent to it. So, so when Jesus comes, and you got, see, we, we read this and we don't, we don't get it because we're not Jews and we were not steeped in Judaism and in the law of Moses and having to meet all these commandments and ordinances and bring all these sacrifices and offerings for everything. We don't get it. When Jesus is coming toward John and John looks up and all the Jews are listening to him and he says, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. See, we don't hear that the same as they do because when he said the Lamb of God, they understood that it was every one of their responsibilities to bring a lamb. God didn't supply the lambs. The lamb had to be supplied from my flock. So the... So the lamb that was offered was something I brought to God. John is saying, wait a minute. God's flipping this whole thing. You don't have to bring a lamb anymore. God is now supplying the lamb for your righteousness. Did you hear what I just said? See, that goes over our Western heads. But every Jew who heard that was like, wait, wait a minute, wait, 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 we got to bring lambs. Hmm. And God was saying, no, 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 from now on, you don't have to bring any lambs. I'm going to provide the lamb. Do, do you know, even today in Judaism, even today in Judaism, the blowing of the shofar which is a ram's horn, which is a type of sheep, is a foreshadowing of the sacrifice that God would make that would, that, that would alleviate the people from having to make a sacrifice. Because remember, when Abram is going to sacrifice his son, Right? He's going to sacrifice his son. And then right before he strikes his son, God says, no, don't, don't touch the boy. Don't touch the lad. He said, I have provided myself a sacrifice. 
And the Bible says that Abram looked over behind him and there was a ram caught with his caught with his horns. See, his horns were caught, which is why the chauffeur is a ram's horn. It is a symbol of the sacrifice that God provides so you don't have to bring one. Justification. Justification is the state of being in which the demands or claims of justice against one have been satisfied. Justification is the state of being in which the demands or claims of justice against one have been satisfied. In other words, you are justified when every claim that could be brought against you has been satisfied. And it's not that no one can bring an accusation against you. It is that there are no more accusations to be brought. See, it's not that you can't be accused. It's that there's no evidence of any wrongdoing. This is why when Paul is writing in the book of Romans, he asks the question, it's not rhetorical, who can bring a charge? against God's elect. Who, who can do it? Because the evidence of every wrong you've ever done has been deleted, eradicated, and erased by the blood of Jesus. So even when the enemy accuses you, he is accusing you based on evidence he doesn't have. No, you're not, you're not listening to me. You're not listening to me. He's accusing you based on evidence he doesn't have. You didn't get what I just said. Did you get what I just said? He's accusing you based on evidence he doesn't have. I, I, I told the story uh, a few weeks ago when I was teaching on something. I don't know where I was, what I was doing, who, where I was. But I was, I was watching... I was watching an old movie. I think it was a F Cary Grant movie, Fred Astaire movie, something like that. I was watching an old movie. I think it was a, a Fred Astaire movie. I was watching an old movie, and, and I saw Fred Astaire, and he was sharp. Fred Astaire was clean. Now, he was always well-dressed, and he was dancing, and it was just magnificent and beautiful. It was, but, and, and while I'm watching it, the, the, the Holy Spirit says, we pay attention. See, when, when, you're, when you're dialed in, you're always dialed in. God can speak anything. That, he can use anything to teach us up. He, he, and he says, he says, pay attention. I said, yeah. He said, you know the people that you're watching there no longer exist. They're, they're not actually alive on planet Earth. But you're actually seeing them move, dance. And to you, what you're seeing is happening. He said, this is what the enemy does with you. All of the images he's reminding you about are concerning a person who is no longer in existence. The person doesn't exist anymore. He captured the action on film and he keeps replaying them in your mind but that person is no longer alive see you can't be born again if you didn't die are you still here 
Now this is why. Nudge your neighbor and say, pay attention. This is why. This is why what you got to do is you got to get your spirit filled with who God says you are. And let the Holy Spirit paint the picture in you of the new creation and who you really are. So when the enemy starts showing you old movies of people who no longer exist. As real as it looks. I mean, I was watching Fred Astaire dance. I was feeling all the emotions. No, you're not listening to me. I was feeling all the emotions. I was smiling. I had all the joy. But none of those people are, are, are present. And that's what the enemy does with you. He plays these pictures of a person that was crucified with Christ. He plays these pictures and you feel all the emotions, you feel the guilt, you feel the unworthiness, you feel the sadness, and if there's nothing on the inside of you that reminds you that's a lie, See, I'm having to work a little tonight. Romans chapter 5. Now let's go through it. Now we got these terms. Now let's read our Bibles. Okay? You with me? Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse number 17. Did you get all that stuff? Okay, watch this now. I'm going to start verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man separation from the goodness, the fellowship, and the resources, and the influence of God entered the world. Are y'all here? Yes. Therefore, just as through one man, are y'all still here? Yes. Just, as, just as through one man, Sin, or missing the mark, entered the world. Now we got to think. What was the mark that Adam missed? It wasn't the law of Moses. There was no law of Moses. No, 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 no. Can y'all stay with me, please? Yes. I know this is, this, is too, this is too academic, isn't it? Nudge your neighbor and say, we're in the adult class. Remember that, we're in the adult class. No, 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 watch this. Watch. Remember, sin is missing the mark. Therefore, just as through one man missing the mark entered the world and separation. And separation from the goodness, resources, influence, and fellowship with the Father through missing the mark entered the world. So, so before this, there was no separation. Are y'all are, are here? Okay. And now we're, now we're going to get some insight on sin. Because the mark that Adam missed was not the law of Moses. So then sin can't be breaking the law of Moses. Come on, children. This is logic. This is not even spiritual. This is logic. If the mark was missed before the law of Moses, then missing the mark or sin can't be breaking the law of Moses. So what was the mark that was set for Adam? What was the mark? Of every tree of the garden you can eat, but of the tree of the knowledge. Let me ask you a question. What is the knowledge of evil? It's the knowledge of, it's, it's sin consciousness. I do not want you eating from the tree that gives you sin consciousness. I don't have time. I don't have time. 
I don't have time. I, I, could go, I could go into that. We would never get out of here. We wouldn't get out of here. We wouldn't get out of here. And I'm not trying to wow you with revelation. I'm trying to build spiritual truth into your spirit so the enemy cannot toss you to and fro. Can you give me just a few minutes? Okay. So then there was only one mark then. Still here? All right. And thus, watch this, separation from the goodness, influence, resources, and fellowship with God spread to all men because after Adam missed the mark, all men missed the mark. Now pay attention. Pay attention. See, you and I are not, as religion has taught us, being punished for Adam's sin. He just told you before this, through one man missing the mark entered the world, and then separation through missing the mark. So here's what, I want you to see it this way. I want you to see a jet flying through the air. You see the jet flying through the air? Can you see it? There's a jet flying through the air. See it? The jet that's flying through the air is named sin. There's one passenger on the jet. The one passenger on the debt is named death. So the moment the jet lands in New York, death landed in New York because death was the passenger on the vehicle on the jet named Sin. So the moment Sin lands anywhere, Separation from God has also landed there. Now, before the jet landed in New York, there was no sin in New York. So there could be no death in New York. But the moment the jet landed, sin is there and death is there with it. Now everybody can meet death. Are you still here? Yeah. Now stay with me. Now look at verse 13. For until the law, sin, or missing the mark was in the world, but missing the mark is not credited to you where there is no law. Now that's a very powerful statement. Sin is not credited to you where there is no law. And if you read your Bible, in the new covenant, Jesus took away the handwriting that was against you. And sin is not credited where there is no law. That's, I can't get there. Watch this. Nevertheless, separation from God reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. That is Jesus. Now watch this. Death reign. Separation from God began to reign even over those who didn't sin after the similitude, the Bible says, of Adam. And what was the difference between Adam? And he says, Adam was a type of him that was to come. Are y'all still here? Yes. Are you still with me? Have I lost you? Now here's what you've got to understand. Adam, let me put it this way. Jesus was not the first son of God in the earth. Adam was. And in the genealogy, in the genealogy, I, I forget whose genealogy it is. I think it's, it's, it's Matthew's genealogy. Adam is called the son of of God. Are y'all here? Let me, let me, let me, let me just, let me show it to you because I, I, uh, somebody find it for me real quick and save me some time. 
Who knows where it is? Nobody. Uh, it's, it, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's Luke 3.38. Luke 3.38. When it gives the genealogy in verse 38, it says, The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So Jesus is not the first son of God in the earth. Adam is the first son of God. <gasps> Wait a minute, Bishop. Wait a minute, Bishop. But Jesus is called the only begotten son of God. Yes, hear the words, only begotten. Adam wasn't begotten. Adam was created. Are you still here? Now, what does this mean? And, th and this is why, over there, go, go back to Romans. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm being far too academic. Um, go back to Romans real quick, and I, I'll, I'll try to just shut this off somewhere fast. Are you with me? Yes. I said, are you with me? Yes. Okay, so, so watch this. Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Who is a type? Adam is a type of him who was to come. Adam is a type of him who was to come. Now, who was to come? Jesus. So Adam and Jesus, he says, are types. They, they are more than just individuals. They are representatives. Adam is the representative of the Son of God. This is why Jesus is called the last Adam. Adam is the first son of God. He's not begotten, he's created. And Adam is the human representative of humanity before God. This is why the Bible says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Why? These are the two representatives. These are the only two men who come into planet Earth as sons. As sons of God. Everybody else who comes in has to become a son. These two come in as sons. Glory to Jesus. One of them comes in as a son. And the decision he makes in a garden to miss the mark, to disobey what the Father has told him. That decision, because he is the representative of all humanity, the decision he makes affect everybody, affects everybody he represents. Amen. Now you say that's not fair. But listen, we do this in our government. I don't have anything against North Korea. But if the president goes to war against North Korea as my representative, guess what? I'm in war with North Korea, and I have to conduct myself. I can't go to North Korea if I want to. So his decision affects how I live. Adam's decision, because he was the representative, affects how everybody lives. So he decided to miss the mark, and that passed on everybody who was his representative. The second son in a garden decides I will not miss the mark. He says, if there's any other way to do this, let it come another way, yet not my will, but my Now the fact is, all of humanity is in one of those sons. You are either a son of Adam. Karebo Shande. Karebo Saka. Or you're a son of Yeshua Hamashiach of Jesus. And whoever, whoever is your representative determines your status. Before the Father. This is why. Yes, sir. 
you must be born again. You got to get out of Adam. You got to get out of that original creation and in to the new creation. Hey! Hey! Now, now get it, get it. And just like in the original creation, your status was not based on what you did, but who your representative was. I was born separated from God. Not because of anything I did, but because of who my representative was. In the same way, once I come into Christ, I am... Look at your neighbor and say, can you see it? Can you see it? Can you... your name and say, can you see it? Can... So just like you didn't have to do anything to be separated from God, that wasn't based on your performance. You don't have to do anything to be accepted by God except receive. Can I talk to you a moment? Sit down. Can, can, can I talk to you more? Turn my, turn my lab back on. Now, I need you to see something here, and then I'm going to pray for you and let you go home. Because it is, it is these verses right here that clarify the Unitarian, eternal salvation issue that is right now sweeping through the body of Christ as a deception? That because of what Jesus did, everybody's saved and you don't need to be born again and you don't have to accept Jesus? And, and, and now that I have you here, where are my glasses? And now that I have you here, I need to show this to you so you don't take what I just preached and apply that lie to it. And I need you to see this. Look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. Oh, I need you to see this. Peace to the baby. Now watch, children, please pay attention. Watch this. Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Now watch this. But the free gift is not like the offense. Repeat that after me. But the free gift, the free gift is, not like the offense. is not like the offense. Okay, now he's about to explain this. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace. Now here's the question. What is the gift by the grace? He, see, grace here is not the gift no righteousness here is not the gift salvation, salvation is not the gift let me, let, me, let, me, let me read it but the free gift is not like the offense for if by one man's offense many died much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace so grace here is not the gift being referred to because he, he names the grace of God now the grace of God is a gift but that's not the gift being referred to here the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man. So a gift was given to all humanity by the grace that is extended by what Jesus did. And the gift by the grace abounded to many. Watch this. And the gift 
is not like that which came through the one who sinned. Okay, so what came through the one who sinned? Death. So the gift is not like death either. You still here? For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation to everybody. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Watch this. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Now righteousness is a gift, but righteousness is not the gift being spoken of in verse 15. Eternal life is a gift of God. Righteousness is a gift of God. Grace is a gift of God. But the gift by the grace is not eternal life, it's not righteousness, and it's not grace. The gift that came by the grace is the reason that the offense and what comes through Christ Jesus is not the same. Are you still here? So what is the gift? It's choice. The gift that came by the grace is choice. And this is why he says the gift is not like the offense. Because the offense caused you to be in a state of sin and you had no choice. You were born in it and you had no choice. What Jesus did restores you to where Adam was. Adam had a choice. And so what Jesus did puts you back in the place where you can choose. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Behold, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing you. So what Jesus did doesn't save everybody what Jesus did puts man back in the place where he has the right to shoot did you get it So don't you buy that lie that everybody's saved. And no, 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 no. You still have to choose. But what has happened now is you have been placed back in a position where you don't have to stay in Adam if you don't want to stay in Adam. Pastor Rex, I never understood it. Mama, I never understood it. Elder, I never understood it. But some of the old saints had a revelation of this. They couldn't put it in words. But they had a revelation of it. Which was why they would say things like, Jesus gave me back my right to the tree of life. He restored back to me my right to choose. Adam took away my right to choose. Jesus didn't just save me. He brought back to me my right to choose. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Lay your hand on your brother. Lay your hand on your sister. Lay your hand on somebody and just pray in the Holy Ghost. Just do it for about 60 seconds, please. I'm going to let you go. I promise you I will. Watching my live stream, I'm going to let you go. I know I took a long time. I, I, I put a lot in your spirit tonight. But I want you to get this. Come on, lay your hands on your brother. Lay your hands on your sister. 
Sibo koshan de la mat. Sibo ria sandele bokishat. Ela boriandele mo sandele bashtika. Hallelujah. This is what this is what righteousness gave back to me. This is what the blood gave back to me. Gave me back the right to choose. I don't have to accept what the devil brings. I don't have to accept the state I was born in. I don't have to accept what people say about me. I don't have to accept it. I have the right to choose to be in Christ Jesus. I have the right to choose. I have the right to declare I'm the head and not the tail. I have the right to declare I'm healed and not sick. I have the right to declare I'm righteous and not unworthy. I have the right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I said glory to God. And the more you find out about what God has said to you, the more you choose the right things to say, the right things to speak, 